And thanks all of you for coming today and uh, uh, being part of this conversation and sharing this uh, wonderful occasion uh, with us. Um, and also wanted to actually in the start, wanted to thank and congratulate Alana as well uh, for the wonderful exhibition you put up here and the talk you gave earlier. I think uh, some of the things you said earlier, uh, such as uh, sort of the absurdities of uh, infrastructural dreams that you're pointing out, uh, what you said about um, how, um, you know, these invisible and in imperceptible forms of violence that sort of perpetuate, perpetuate through uh, the everyday, uh, through the lived sort of uh, everyday life uh, that we all go through. Um, I think what you said about, um, uh, what you suggested about how to sense time, about uh, sort of what kind of temporality we need to be in touch with, uh, you said something about how to think about histories and the present as a sort of a, a continuum. Uh, and I think also your work um, sort of having in the background the context of another way of sort of relating to place, uh, one that is more sort of uh, attached to and speaks from a place of uh, care and entanglement with place and other beings. Uh, I think all of those are really great foundations for the conversations that uh, we intend to have here as well. Um, so, um, Janak Dai, I mean, uh, I've known him for some time. Um, uh, Janak, I'm really happy to, that you could be here for this conversation, partly uh, mainly because uh, you've actually, your work has been one of the, one, a very important reference point for uh, make the making of the skin of Chitwan. And I also know you personally, we, we were uh, in, at the University of Michigan together, uh, briefly in the same program. Uh, and I was looking at your dissertation earlier today, and I, I saw my name in the acknowledgement, and I felt very proud. <laughs> uh, but I think uh, the reason why uh, I was really keen about having this conversation with you was also, I think, uh, because the skin of Chitwan uh, has ended up kind of focusing on Chitwan um, as a very specific kind of place. Uh, and I, saw, I see your work as something that is adjacent to it, uh, because you work not necessarily in Chitwan or with the Tharu community, but you're working, with, uh, you're working on sort of related histories uh, in the Tharai. And I feel like uh, the conversation with you, uh, I, it really felt to me like um, it could sort of broaden uh, the ambit of the skin of Chitwan uh, so that we can get a fuller sense of what the histories and the entanglements are. Uh, for the making of Tarai as a place. Uh, so um, I'll speak a little bit about the skin of Chitwan, not too much, but I think my intention here uh, is really to kind of get uh, Janak Dai to speak about the issues, actually the themes and the problematics that we were um, dealing with uh, through the skin of Chitwan. Um, uh, because, I mean, he has a lot to say, um, and I think um, the, ex the exp extension to the Dhimal community that you have uh, studied uh, and your own sort of uh, research in malaria, I feel like that those things have a lot to add to the conversation. Uh, so the way the conversation will be set up is I will be asking Janak Dai a set of questions uh, based on sort of my own understanding and my own sort of uh, the research that we did uh, during the skin of Chitwan uh, and um, letting the Janak Dai answer the questions. Um, so I'll say a little bit about the skin of Chitwan as a sort of like a, uh, maybe like a preface to the conversation today. Um, the skin of Chitwan in a way was uh, imagined as sort of an archive, as a speculative archive for the Anthropocene. Uh, and that's a sort of like a word that uh, several of you may be familiar with by now, a sort of a buzzword that's circulating among schol scholars as well as artists, as well as sort of uh, publics as well. Uh, but the, uh, the Anthropocene being sort of this recognition of a, of a new uh, geological age uh, viewed as the period during which human activity um, uh, has become sort of the dominant influence on the earth and, and uh, the proposition being that now we can see a sort of a layer on the crust of the earth, on the, on the earth itself uh, of the impact of the new age of the humans. But, I mean, um, the idea for us was not really to pursue the, specifically what the uh, implications of the Anthropocene is, but really sort of what kind of histories um, and what kind of archives and stories we need to be paying attention to, um, given the kind of problems that of, of actually the environmental disasters and ecological crises um, that we are facing. Uh, so we posited, it's a sort of, at the start we posited an archive uh, that could bring together perhaps accounts of um, 
about human life, about uh, the earth, as well as the non-humans. Um, um, and by sort of bringing these different accounts, uh, speculating and hoping that they can sort of um, maybe enable us, maybe help us to face the ecological crises, um, maybe in a better way. Um, and also, I think these, uh, we, uh, we imagined it as an archive uh, that can maybe help us think outside the narratives of uh, progress and development. And I, I know Janak Dai will have a lot to say about that. Um, and maybe help us have other dreams about the future, as Alana was also, in a way, alluding earlier. Um, I think in the process, uh, indigeneity has become a very like, important concept uh, for us. Um, because it has set up um, various types of memories and knowledges, histories, as well as experiences of oppression and uh, uh, marginalization, and sort of the deep collective work uh, that goes uh, that has emerged uh, because of that, uh, as perspectives and and as a ground from which to analyze, uh, understand, as well as sort of uh, reckon with the uh, the disruptive processes of um, modernity, colonialism, and as well as capitalism. Um, so um, I think um, the other thing that uh, thinking about the indigenous has been, why the thinking about indigenous has been important for the skin of Chitwan um, is also really to think about what indigenous knowledge is and uh, practices are, uh, and how they can be really, uh, how they can be important guides uh, for reflecting on our own sort of temporal and uh, spatial conditions and why that is important at this juncture. Um, and I say I specify those things because uh, they have very direct implications for archive making, thinking about history and time, um, and, and uh, imagining what kind of archives we should be building, um, activating, um, mobilizing, and the sort of the stories and narratives we need uh, for our times. Um, I also, I think the reason why I'm really excited um, uh, to speak to you today, Janaktai, I think I see this overla overlap with the concern that Skin of Chitwan has uh, over sort of this, uh, you know, the question of place, which I think I know you've been working with a lot. You've been thinking about placemaking, um, being in place um, uh, a lot through your work. Uh, and, I, and how we sort of make and remake space, how we belong to a place uh, as a sort of a central problematic that you've been dealing with through your work. Uh, so I've set up sort of the questions uh, primarily around that concern. Um, and, and I think the, the, the argument in a way that the, social, the skin of Chitwan was making um, is really about Chitwan's history uh, is a, as one where we can, st we can starkly see sort of different ge uh, geographical visions um, in conflict and, how, you know, and the sort of the contesta those contestations not only being a matter of the past, but also a very alive and present ones. Uh, and again, the hope always being that by paying attention to these conflicts over ge uh, geographical visions, uh, that maybe we will be able to um, have perhaps a different, different set of, uh, or a different kind of uh, geographical visions for ourselves and for our future. And one idea that uh, Skin of Chitwan mobilized a lot with regards to this is what we called orientation, uh, which is really about sort of what infrastructure has done um, in terms of how we move, how we sort of are in place, what kind of identities are allowed to us. Um, and to really also think about indigenous orientations or other ways of orienting in place as being something perhaps still latent or active in these places and something that we can turn to, uh, specifically to dream of other futures. Um, so uh, to start, I wanted to, um, I think the first kind of question, can I, can I, yeah, yeah, of yeah. course, yes, please, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, thank you, Divas, yeah. and uh, you know, the organizer for, I'm really honored to be here uh, for inviting me. Uh, before we, you know, uh, before I'm, we jump into the conversation, I thought uh, it's very important that I, I do make some disclaimers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and I'm a bit nervous uh, 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 because uh, I'm not a scholar on Taru, or I've not studied, I'm not a scholar on Chitwan, uh, its history, the place. Uh, you know, my, my visit to Chitwan has been 
you know, mostly, uh, I would assume that, you know, that's what many of us have been visited Chiton to see, you know, to do the jungle safari or just to like, you know, just to like, you know, escape away from the Kathmandu and just be there, you know, uh, see all these wildlife and others and, and talk to Tharu people uh, as they guide us through the Raptor rivers. You know, that's also been one of, you know, I was also part of the uh, school where we used to bring American students uh, every year and we used to take them to Chiton for relax and, you know, for, you know, breaking them away from this, you know. So that's had been my part of the journey. So I'm not here as as expert or scholars on Tharu. So I've been working with a, you know, group called Dhimal. Uh, they are the Adivasi from the Eastern Nepals. Um, I've been working with them since uh, for my PhD research and from um, 2015 onward I've been doing what I've called Fusat ethnography, kind of like, you know, uh, uh, short-term uh, research for long-term studies. And I've been uh, focusing more on social history of malaria, by which I've been focusing more, not malaria, uh, uh, the, it's epidemiology, or it's, it's, it's you know, it's um, um, how malaria happened, but more on what was happening when malaria was there, what was particularly the relationship between Adibasi and non Adibasi when the Tarai was full of malarial environment. So that's where I have been you know, focusing more on. And I'm, I've been trying to understand how particular, you know, uh, ecological uh, history, uh, the existing history, had uh, in a way uh, influenced the culture, the history, and, uh, you know, Dimal's understanding of who they are as an indigenous people, as a collectives, and how they still, you know, how their particularly their ritual still expresses those relationships in many ways, uh, and that's something that you know when I was looking at the exhibitions, uh, 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 it also like really you know, fascinated me. So I'd like to congratulate Darren. Um, I will be. Uh, he was told me that you know uh, this will be in English, but I might just like you know code switch between English and Nepali, because that's what I do. Uh, so you know I I'm not. Uh, really, you know, habitual of speaking English for a long time. So, you know, uh, but I'll try to do justice to, uh, to both. And I'm also nervous because <laughs> many of my students are here. So, <laughs> so they're gonna grade me. <laughs> uh, but I'll, I'll be happy to, uh, to, uh, to, to get the grades from them. Uh, so thank you for coming, my students particularly. Thank you, Janakai. So I, I think the first sort of, um, thing I want to posit to you, um, I think um, this concept or the term indigeneity that, you know, I think we've been working with, um, I think Alana also, but I think that's been part of the conversation here at the festival. Um, when we, uh, when Skin of Chitwan turns to uh, the concept of indigeneity, I think it does it partly because it wants to activate this other way of relating to each other, but also to the sort of the stories of care that we need to tell about ourselves uh, and the land. Um, but I wanted to hear from you, uh, partly because I think when I sort of um, look at that term, when I examine that term, I find that there are a lot of contestations over the meaning of the term itself, um, about who gets to claim to be indigenous and who gets excluded from it. Um, I think both in the sort of the global context in which this term is sort of taking hold, uh, but also specifically in the Nepali context, um, I think the translations to uh, the terms that are common here uh, one being Janajati, um, which, which designates ethnicities, um, and the other one being Adivasi, uh, which translates something like uh, uh, perhaps the Aboriginal or the first uh, or the tribal is what earlier used to be called. But I wanted to hear from you about uh, your use of the, of the term indigenous and what, how you would suggest us to sort of define it. Uh, what do you find um, empowering about the term and what you find limiting about this concept? Uh, thank you, Dios. This is a very difficult question, by the way. <laughs> There's a series of difficult <laughs> questions coming at you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dios. This is very important questions. Uh, I, I have focused for my PhD dissertation. I focus on uh, what I call indigenous activisms of the Mals. So, uh, so my my research started uh, in 2006. Uh, just to locate for those uh, um, who may not have, you know, um, uh, uh, maybe like, you know, uh, who may not have a proper idea of 2006 in Nepal. This was a time when, you know, uh, Nepal was engulfed in the in discussion of federalisms and new kind of political imaginations was possible. Uh, you could, you could, people were claiming, you know, uh, that, you know, there should, uh, uh, Nepal should be federated uh, along ethnic lines and other things. Uh, so, that's when I started to uh, do my field work. So then 
talking about indigenous uh, indigeneity, uh, I am not. I, I think you know. I, I'm not going to uh, go with the definition. And everything. I think indigenous in the context of Nepal is uh, like el elsewhere. It's a very much contested uh, definitions, and the contestations uh, comes from you know, different angles. When it comes to Nepal, uh, I think what is important to understand is that uh, till uh, you know early 90s. All the Nepalese were, you know, uh, the nation state and, and the rulers uh, did not recognize the diversity in Nepal. And there was a lot of issues with that. So, you know, when uh, with the uh, political change in the 1990s, it offered the political space of claiming different identities based on your language, based on your culture, than where we started to, you know, have these new ideas of, you know, Janajati, you know, Jati and Janajati. And then it was also a time when you know, you know, there was a resurgence of global indigenous movements all over the world. And then it was obvious that you know, people, those who claimed to, uh, themselves to be indigenous in Nepal, aligned themselves with this um, global political movement. So I, I'm, 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 I'm bringing this short you know, uh, fragments of history just to, uh, uh, just to underline the uh, claim, uh, idea that uh, indigenous, uh, the concept of indigenous people in Nepal and elsewhere is very much a political concept. What does that mean? It's a very much a political context in the sense that it is a concept based on rights, which are internationally recognized. It is a concept in which the people who claim themselves to be indigenous are negotiating with the state and non-state actors for recognizing themselves as a people and recognizing ter territorial rights and other kinds of rights, of course. We, having said that, who, 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 can who can claim to be indigenous and who is indigenous has always been uh, a major you know, contestation everywhere. And this contestation was there in 1990s. And this contestation comes in Nepal every time. And you, know, you can, for example, what happened with the declaration of uh, you know, uh, province one as Koshi Pradesh would again, would, steer this converse, uh, you know, uh, conversation. Uh, but indigeneity is not just about being Adibasi or being Janjati uh, in Nepal and elsewhere. So indigeneity is also about locating oneself and claiming you know, certain kind of worldviews, if you like, the ontology of being in the world, which I would argue, and others have also argued, would challenge what is uh, challenge the idea of self and the relationship, what we can call territory or the nature. And it also challenges the idea and the practices of what is happening now, the, you know, the extraction, you know, the dest destructions of you know, uh, resources and everything. I think there lies this you know, importance of indigenous. So indigenous, in, indigeneity, you know, when, for example, uh, just to give an example, when, when Dimal said that you know, we are the first people in this region to step on, on this soil, they're not discrediting the fact that there were others. Or, so what does that claim mean? When, when Tharu said that you know, we are the people of forest, what does that mean? I think we need to, you know, you know, uh, we need to listen to their understanding and, and, and understand what is their position. Why are they saying we are a people of forest? I think there lies uh, the significance of indigeneity. So in a way, indigeneity would open up uh, for us uh, who may not like the idea, for us and others who may not like the idea of the concept of indigeneity, but is still looking at indigeneity And trying to make sense of the the why people are using it, I think there are some, you know there are certain you know uh, there are important uh, areas of you know discussions and knowledge and maybe you know alternative perspective and views and practices that needs to be recognized. I think that's what indigeneity is important for me, Divas. I think. Yeah. No, thank you, Janaka. I mean, I really like how you. I think you did and uh, end up providing a kind of a definition for it. And I think uh, I re really like how you, what you said about uh, that it is about location in a way, that about locating. And I see that I think uh, initially I'd actually wanted to ask you not about indigeneity, but 
the, ter the term placemaking that you use and indigenous placemaking as a sort of a framework that you have. But I, I think I th that's what I want you to talk about more. I think in our earlier conversation as well, uh, we had ended up talking a lot about uh, sort of this question of the land. Um, and I think uh, land being, for in Skin of Chitwan, for instance, uh, land is really the main framework. And I think the way we have tried to enter into that conversation is through both through the physicality, but also the metaphors of the soil. Um, of, um, and sort of the, you know, the s transformations that we can encounter in the archive that the soil keeps, uh, and how, what kind of history can be dug, th dug out through, uh, or retold through the soil. And I mean this not only in the sense of um, by land or by soil, um, not just an account, uh, which is what you'll see uh, primarily in the skin of Chitwan, of the sort of various sort of uh, technologies and practices that are done on the soil um, and the records that creates. But I think also important were um, the sort of the ideas and uh, conceptions of land uh, that are active and how sort of that has sh you see that shifting in the 20th century. Uh, and that creates these very different legacies um, uh, for the place that we have, uh, for the place that is the Rai. Um, I, I know from your work on Dhimal that that's what you are primarily concerned with. And I think uh, what you've, you talked about uh, identity, Dhimal identity, uh, the sort of place making and territory making that you talk about uh, are closely, and also issues, uh, the framing of uh, Dhimal rights and issues around land and landlessness. Uh, that features very um, a lot in your work. Um, I wanted you to sort of tell us, maybe uh, through your work and your research, uh, maybe give us a picture of um, sort of the story of the land uh, and how sort of Tarai as a space has been made and remade and unmade uh, through that story. Uh, thank you, Divas. This is a fascinating uh, question uh, for sure. Uh, uh, I mean, many people have written about, you know, the making of Tarai as a state's space, the making of Tarai as a geography of extraction. And I, I do, uh, I do uh, you know, also belong to that school of thought that, you know, uh, in the sense, you know, uh, I'm not going, uh, you know, when Tarai started, when was, you know, Tarai made, that's a long history. Uh, but uh, particularly what is important for the skin of uh, Chitu and the uh, resource, and also for my study is, how Tarai was imagined or taken uh, as a state space, I'm not using as a place, state space by Nepal's uh, ruling, uh, in Nepal's uh, Nepali state and its uh, rulers uh, since Tarai became part of Nepal. So that's also very important. There is two, uh, you know, uh, in my work, you know, in my study, I approach these questions with two broader framework. The first one is political economy. What does that mean? That means, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, since long, uh, hill rural, particularly hill rurals, rurals, including, you know, including uh, rulers from Nepal later on, you know, uh, in 19th and 18th century, they've always considered Tarai to be an important place, uh, place, in, uh, important space for extractions, you know, land, labor, you know, uh, other kind of resources to support their and, you know, ruling their state. So that is that is one important that continues today as well. So, so there had been from the beginning uh, when you bring state and the uh, and the um, Tarai, there had been a, a colonial relationship. You know, colonial in the sense uh, the resources, the place, the geography is important resources. Uh, but then you extract, but you do not become become accountable to the people. The people were always considered as a liability. Now comes the other point that I was, you know. So if you if you take nation as a geo body, then Tarai was always a place, uh, always a, a space that was threatening to the integrity of the purity of Hindu nation. One, it was it was a frontier, you know. Then it was also a, a space where. You know, uh, beyond beyond that borders was the you know the India and the British India and the Muslims you know who were not Hindus and and there was a threat that you know it was always polluting. Therefore, people coming from Tarai as well as from Tibet. Uh, so since we are not talking about the north here, they were required to purify themselves when they enter into Kathmandu. So that was the attitude. You know, so so 
so it had a very contradictory relationship. At one point, uh, Torai, you know, at one, Torai, in one side, Torai was a very important, you know, geography of extraction, you know, resources. But on the other hand, it was also somehow, you know, uh, could be defilling, you know, space. So, so therefore, you know, that idea uh, continued for a long. And, and, and in terms of, like, you know, the placemaking, so there was a multiple models of placemaking, what, how Tharu on this, how Tharu, you know, experienced and imagined, you know, Chiton, for example, was different from how uh, the people, uh, the, those in, in power in Kathmandu saw Chiton and, 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 and treated Chiton, for example. We all know, I mean, that which also comes there is, you know, Chiton was, for example, uh, earlier, it was not for the farming, but the, the forest was important. And the forest was both uh, in terms of like a natural guard, uh, you know, uh, to, to check the enemy, and also for the hunting reserve. You know, many of the Thai, you know, was also a hunting reserve. I, I bring this, you know, hunting, uh, you know, the royal hunting as expedition. So the hunting was a very theatrical performance of the state power, you know. So the Tharus were used to, you know, uh, you know, look after the animals and the wild animals. And, and they use they would use the you know Tharus and Adivasi's knowledge for hunting, but then the you know uh, the, the kings, the Rana prime ministers would go there and and, and, and they would hunt uh, for a, for a month. It's not just in Chitwan, but they would also go uh, to Koshi in, in the far uh, you know eastern area. So so the hunting is uh, hunting was a very important exercise of you know power. It it showed you know what state could consist of the use of violence. Uh, the massacres of animals and its display, you know, its display and the photographs and, you know, big, you know, important uh, foreign dignitaries like King George V coming to join the hunting, you know. All these kind of, you know, performance were, in a way, uh, were also a good reminder for the Tharus that, okay, we are the subjects, you know, we, we are, you know, we are the subjects and, the, you know, animals, if I kill any animals, I could be punished. Or, or if I kill uh, at the time, if I kill, quote unquote, you know, um, you know, uh, an animal, uh, for example, a rhino elephant, I have to pay and, and uh, pay the tax. And the skin, that's where <laughs> the skin of the rhino or animal, you know, needed to be, you know, sent to the darbar. So, having said that, so then, you know, so the forest was a space where Adibasi and the, and the state power had a different encounter. And there was the land. The land for the state, uh, for the rulers, the land was uh, a state property that could be rented for agriculture so that they could collect the tax. So the land was, an, again, another you know, important uh, areas where they stood. And for other Adivasis like you know, uh, Maji and Bote, the rivers were also a place where, space where they would encounter the state uh, you know, power. And then, so this continued, and this has had a very important uh, implications for how, you know, uh, later on how the state started to colonize uh, the Tarai in the name of development later, and how international, you know, uh, Nepal's international partners joined, uh, you know, Nepal, uh, Nepalese government in order to modernize Nepal and then colonize, continue the, colon I mean, ex uh, you know, s s expand the colonization of Tarai uh, for because I think I will stop here. So what I'm what I'm saying. So you know. So when we talk about place making uh, in the context uh, of Tarai, I think that uh, you know uh, the political project of place making needs to be you know taken into uh, a central analytics. You know, uh, uh, and I might be you know criticized for like just highlighting this in, in a political project. I think, but for me and for the Adivasis uh, with whom I work, this political project was was very 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 important. Uh, to the extent that, uh, you know, when they were given a chance, or given when they're asked to register their land, they prefer to be landless in the sense they prefer not to own any land because they knew that if I own the land, that means if I register my land under my name, I am already being, you know, part of the state power. So, so in a way, not owning the land means not registering the name, name and land under my name or under my family's name was a way of evading this oppressive and extractive part of the state. So we can see you know, how the people therein, 
experience, practice land, relations with the land, which I, when I say land, I'm, I'm talking in the land in a very broad, you know, uh, you know, in a very broader way, not just, uh, you know, land as, you know, a geographical entity that could be measured. You know. So in more in terms of territory, or what in a Sanskrit is called like the bhumi. And, 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 you know, just to bring you the idea that, you know, now in Nepal, the land reform office is called bhumi sudar, which is a very, very contradictory. You know, Bhumi being the soil, Bhumi being, you know, relationship with soil and other entity, and we have a, you know, ministry on, you know, in Nepal uh, that wants to reform the Bhumi. That means, you know, land. So they, they want to reform the Bhumi means we measure the land and, you know, get the land and distribute. So that's how, you know, there is a, this epistemic violence as well uh, in the use of the place, uh, the concept of, you know, land as a Bhumi. Um, I think I'm going over the places, but I will. I will no, no. It. Actually, I mm. wanted to uh, ask you more about that. Like, uh, I think we've discussed also uh, when we met the other day. But uh, you know, like in the 1960s, the early 1960s, uh, when uh, King Mahindra sort of takes over, uh, and that being the moment where we have this new language for speaking about the land, which uh, sort of you started alluding to right now, where now we begin to speak of land uh, as as sort of something that can be owned. Uh, I think you see that, I think, in the practices that are being done to land in Chitwan as well. Uh, land is something that can be parceled, bought and sold. Uh, those are sort of new, not necessarily new, but I think this is a time when the, there's a sort of an exacerbation of that kind of ideology around land. And I, I think the, what you just alluded as well, what happens when, you know, what has happened, let's say, in Nepal, uh, when we sp start speaking of land as something that needs reform? Uh, land as something, uh, the word, as you said in Nepali, being Bhumi Sudar, uh, there's also, we also speak of Bhumi uh, Biavastha, uh, which would mean land is something that needs managed. the state to come in, to, re to be reformed, to be managed, to be organized, and to be s stabilized. Uh, and that kind of ideology about land has pretty much taken over. Um, and so I wanted you to, uh, to ask you about what you think has been the consequence for this nation. Um, uh, of that. Uh, thank you, Divas. I, I may not be able to, you know, go into the, I mean, I don't have a, you know, uh, knowledge about the land reform and, you know, it's, but, but just I would like to link for the discussions uh, what you have said with the experiences of the Mals, and I, I'm sure it also resonates with the experiences of uh, the Tharus uh, that I've read. I mean, you know, it was not just 1960s, long before that, uh, in Nepal, when with the coming of the uh, Nepali state, uh, then Gorkhali Rajya, land was considered as the, you know, property of the king. So, you know, uh, we, we might just remember that until 15 years ago, or maybe, you know, uh, uh, less than that, we had this, uh, the earlier uh, national song in which we used to, uh, refer to the king, salute to the king as Bhupati. The king as Bhupati. And all, all the legal documents will say king as a Bhupati. Bhupati means, you know, in one way is Bhupati. You know, husband of land, or maybe in the, you know, the owner of land, the Pati being, you know, the husband. So, Bhupati. So, it's, it's, it's a very power, you know. Uh, so, the king had all, the, uh, the king who embodied the state was the Bhupati. That means the state was the actual sovereign owners of the land. And that could include anything, forest and so Bhupati. So all, all the people within the territory of uh, the Bhupati king were their you know, tenants, where in a way they were using their subjects. There was no concept of you know, citizen. You know, that is very, very modern. They were righty. You know, the one, the subjects who would pay tax for using the kings. So the, the king would you know, say, uh, you, know, you are actually eating up the salt, the metaphor salt, you know, out of my land. Means you, know, you are sustaining your life. Whatever things you are eating, whatever you are made of is coming from my land. So there is a very, uh, that was a strong idea about, you know, the people, the subjects being uh, the users of the land, they have a limited rights, but they need to be, you know, obedient and loyal to the king, to the palace, to the state for using the land. And this was a contradictory practices for many communities, and the community that I know best is the Malp community. I'll just give some examples. The Malps did not have the idea of land as something to be worn. You know, uh, 
In 1848, uh, you know, a British, uh, British uh, resident in Nepal, uh, Hudson has recorded, he was one of the first, you know, foreign scholars to record it, foreign person to record it, uh, something on Dimal. So he, he, he wrote then, you know, he met Dimals uh, in West Bengal, uh, probably in Darjeeling, uh, and they, they, they were, they had migrated to Darjeeling, uh, and they told uh, Hudson that they had migrated to Darjeeling, or uh, in West Bengals, after the uh, Morong came under Prithibana and Saha, because then things changed therein, you know, there were things changed. So, uh, and then, the, and what uh, Watson to, uh, you know, uh, writes is that, you know, they might have no concept of, you know, land as property. That's something they need to own. So, even now, Dimal's word for land is bonai, which means soil. You know, bonai is soil. And, and whenever they use soil or land for any ritual thing, ritual uh, event, they'll use this as a, the term bonai. They do have a meaning uh, for the land as a jagga or you know, something uh, to own. That is called milling. But very interestingly, in, you know, to my knowledge, to my research, uh, there is no mention of milling the idea, the concept of milling, when the mals are performing any rituals. In rituals context, it's just one eye. And, and they have different, you know, um, uh, different, uh, uh, in many of the rituals, you know, for example, in their funeral, you know, they need to offer, you know, soil to uh, the person who have passed away. And, what, and one of the reasons they said, well, our, we have come from the soil. I mean, we have come from our mother, but in our, then our bodies, everything we eat, you know, it comes from the soil. So, you know, life from the soil and life goes back to the soil. And then they also like offer the soil uh, to the dead. So in, that also in a way shows how they, they, they see this soil not just as something to be worn, but the relationship, you know, the mutuality being, you know, soil and, and, and the property of the soil and their bodies. So, you know, in a way that kind of idea of person also signifies how we can call it this as an Adibasi ontology, if you like, Adibasi, Adibasi worldview or perception of the reality that has a different relationship the, uh, uh, to, uh, to the land. But having said that, I don't want to give the idea that you know, the Bals really didn't care for the land, but, they, but when the state started to penetrate into Morong, particularly after the you know, construction of railways in India uh, in, you know, in the mid-90s, there was a pressure for the Mals and other Azibashi to reclaim the land, you know, so that the state could generate revenue or, and there could be, you know, more uh, connections between uh, India and Nepal. And that's when, you know, there is an oppressive feudalism emerged in Morong area, you know, and then many of, some of the Dimals also became, before that, Dimals were more or less, you know, uh, they would stay in one place for some time. It was a malarial, uh, you know, uh, ecology, uh, and, and then, you know, they were, they were not, they did not subsist on farming. They did agriculture, they did some limited farming, but they did not stop in farming because farming was not a viable, uh, you know, livelihood option. Because if they crop anything, the wildlife would eat it up, you know. And so the land was not fertile enough. So they would just practice simple farming, but they would just like move from one place to another. And another is that they had to move from one place to another. Another place was the epidemics of, of cholera, you know. Uh, uh, I, I'm not, I haven't really you know, done a history on you know, when actually st cholera started in the Tarai. Uh, uh, but uh, in their memories, uh, in current, they mentioned cholera as being more life-threatening than malaria. They would, you know, they would survive malaria somehow, but cholera, with cholera, they had to, whole village would be you know, wiped out. So they had to move from one place to another. And when the uh, state started to pressure them to you know, do uh, farming, uh, you know, settle down and do farming as, many st as the state would like to do it, and then they would, they would not, they would refuse to take land is their, in their entitlement. I think that was very important that, you know, that. so the idea that land was precious, land was important resources for all the farmers, all the peasant community in during the 19th century, that's what economic history would, uh, historian would write, including uh, M.C. Rekmi. I'm not denying the fact, yes, land was important for majority of the you know, farming communities, but we need to ask who were they. So peop, 
what, what I'm arguing is, so, you know, one of the important, uh, you know, idea concept uh, is the idea of kipat. You know, the Limbu had a communal land ownership kipat. And the idea of kipat is also used to talk about, you know, Adivasi in Tarai. Mm -hmm. And what I've, ar what I've argued based on the work is that that kind of idea of kipat does not really, you know, apply to uh, groups like Dimal and, and uh, Gimal who, who were not a farming community until you know early 19 uh, early 20th century so with the, with that their relationship with the land was more about relation with the territory ecological niche you know they knew they knew which part of you know area was theirs and they would move around and with that you know uh, they also did not when they were not motivated to own the land and so that's something that I've been you know I've written uh, is that how land actually became a source of suffering that means you know owning land became a source of suffering for the Bals. so I think you know these uh, stories are important to understand uh, how you know how Adivasi responded when uh, the landlord state really penetrated in their community and claim the rights of their you know territories and try to you know, convert them uh, i'm using my uh, the term convert in a very conscious way convert them into you know right that means land tax paying subjects who could you know tame land who could clear the forest they were forced to clear the forest and when they clear the forest someone would come and claim rights over the land oh that's our birta or that's our land and then again, they would be pushed down. And they knew that, you know, the more they would help the state project, the more, you know, uh, the more, you know, uh, displacement they would fear. So very interestingly, you know, uh, some demand would say to me, uh, the, the, the state was like a cholera. When the cholera epidemics brushed out, we have to move, you know, from one place to another way, you know. And in the same way, when we became, a, you know, subject of the state, you know, ultimately we had to, you know, we have to be displaced from that area. Whether when we clear the land, someone would come, oh, that's our land, this is our tin type, and then they would, they, they were, uh, they were forced. Uh, so, 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 Adivasi like Dimal and, and Tharus, they were not just like, you know, I'm not trying to like, you know, give a romanticized view that, oh, they were just like very natural people, you know, doing, you know, enjoying the forest, their life. But they were equally engaged uh, in the emerging political you know, scenario, the way you know, uh, uh, Hudson recorded in 1848 that you know, the Mals had moved to uh, you know, West Bengal because of after you know, Pritham Ansa came and you know, they destroyed uh, the kind of like, you know, the kind of autonomy they were enjoying earlier. So that kind of you know, multiple emergence, you know, the political economy happening within that you know, regions of Tarai had an impact. Uh, 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 in the local uh, territory, uh, local areas, and people were conscious political actors. They knew what was happening, if not all, and they were also like you know, uh, um, kind of like you know, um, making moves as you know things were in you know, and that that kind of thing also like changed uh, that had an impact on their uh, you know relationship with the land and the territory we talk about. Thank you, Dios. Thank you, Jack. I, um, I think uh, I wanted to press you a little more on um, there, you know, these two types of polities that have come up in the discussion so far. I mean, one on sort of the legacies of the, glo you know, the, the global experience of colonialism, let's say the legacies of colonialism, that I want to ask you in a bit about as well, how that has impacted uh, uh, Tarai. But I think the first, uh, I wanted to like um, dig a little more into this, the, the sort of the South Asian polity, which you have talked about as these forms of kingships and the relationship with uh, the people around, but also land, which you have described already. But uh, I was remembering, like as you were speaking, um, there was a professor at U Michigan when we were there together, uh, uh, Thomas Troutman, who I think probably was an uh, advisor for you. Mm -hmm. um, he uh, recently put out a book on elephants. Um, and I was thinking about that because uh, one of the things he says in the book is that uh, there is something unique about the relationship that the South Asian kings have had with elephants. Uh, whereas elephants have always been like this very important sort of uh, symbols of power. If you look at uh, kingships across the world, uh, ancient sort of uh, uh, kingships as well, ancient uh, from um, 
yeah, uh, Egypt to everywhere, in fact. But he says how, like, in other places where uh, elephants perhaps served more of a, a symbolic purpose, where they would be used for, like, these massive spectacular uh, sacrifices or sort of uh, the spectacles of consumption of ivory, so forth. Uh, what the South Asian kings had figured out in a way was that uh, the elephants could be used for wars, that they were, as a sort of a war, a technology of war, they were very useful. What that meant for the South Asian kings, uh, he says, is that uh, that meant uh, a particular kind of place making in a way that the forest had to be reserved uh, because elephants are very difficult to raise, um, to be domesticated, because they eat a lot. Uh, so they, the imagination of these large sort of skates of forests where the elephants would roam, and, and the kings, and I, I, actually the, uh, the idea of the mahut and the relation of tharus as mahut is very much tied to this, uh, that, you know, the labor of the, often these indigenous people to domesticate, to form relations to the elephants is a very important part of how uh, the South Asian kings, uh, and I think I would say Nepali kings as well, uh, relied on to sort of build their own sort of notions of power and authority and how to exercise that. But I was very intrigued by this, uh, this question of how uh, the idea of wilderness, you know, the space of conservation uh, that is separate from, let's say, the civilization, civilized part of the, of the world, uh, that is very much part of the conception of the South Asian uh, kingship. Um, but I, I was wondering if you had some more uh, insight about that, you know, so in terms of the forest landscape and how th those kind of spaces have, uh, what kind of role they have played uh, in, the, in the way um, that kingships are kind of um, formed. Um, well, I don't know, Divas, uh, I would be, you know, uh, um, you know I, I don't think I have a very, you know, uh, solid, explanation for that, uh, partly because uh, the group that I work with, um, they, the relationship uh, with uh, the elephant uh, is somehow, it's more in terms of rituals, which, you know, uh, in terms of rituals, uh, in, in rituals one, and they were not, unlike Tharus, uh, Dimal was not used by by the state to look after the elephant, you know, uh, you know, more, in, it was Tharus, I think, you know, in Nepal, in, in Torai particularly, it was the Tharu who were, uh, you know, employed by the state. And, but having said that, there were some, you know, uh, what do we call Hatisa, that's where the elephants are kept as a captive for the state. Uh, there were Hatisa in the Eastern Nepal as well. But uh, later on, what happened when, with the, you know, with the feudalism coming on in the late, uh, 18th century, uh, in the early uh, 19th century, um, uh, in Tarai, in, in, in the mid, um, you know, 19th century, in, uh, among the Dimals, some of the Dimals also were, uh, some of the Dimals also became the landlord, and and as a rule, at the end of the rule, they were also allowed to use the elephant. So, definitely, in 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 that way, they were also, you know, trying to be, you know, emulate the king's, you know, uh, royal power. But that's the politi that's there. But also the fact that you know uh, elephant and horses are used uh, in all the Dimal's rituals, and which is also a true, uh, which is also true that you know elephants, uh, you know uh, the uh, the figurines of elephants are everywhere in many parts of Tarai. You know they would offer, they would you know build uh, you know this kind of you know if if you give statues of elephant and offer it to the uh, village shrines. And that's, uh, you know, uh, there. And the Mals are traditionally not Hindu people. And, and they follow their own religion. And when they are using, you know, uh, the elephant as a symbol of, you know, uh, a sacred, uh, an emblem of sacred deities, it's more to do with, you know, the relationship with the forest and how uh, uh, the elephant, in one way, would destroy their crops, but on the other hand, they would also protect them. Protect them. So the idea was not to tame elephant or use elephant for, you know, some extractive economy or like for extreme product, but to use elephant as a way of, for example, they would say roaming in the forest. 
the, the orientation that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. So they would say, you know, our, our salmon, they would call dhami or priest, you know, they'll ride an elephant and they would just go around, you know, the forest and see what's happening. And so, so the elephant as a rights, uh, you know, uh, as, as some, uh, an animal that they could rely on uh, to roam around the forest, I think that's something different from what, you know, Professor Trotman was talking about king and the elephant as, elephant as, a, you know, uh, tech, uh, weapons uh, or, you know, some technology of war, you know, weapons of war. I think uh, that was not, uh, I, don't, I don't see that happening in the case of the Of course, as I say, as the Mals, you know, uh, were incorporated more and more into the state power, then the Mal landlords, like Tharu landlords, they used to have elephant, and uh, that would symbolize a different kind of state power. You know, so in a way, it was also an indirect rule that you know the, the Kathmandu was ruling Dimals through this intermediary landlords, uh, who would also like you know who would also emulate, who would also copy uh, the symbolic power of the you know, yes. uh, the palace, and and the elephant being that. But what is important uh, to understand, I think, is you know by keeping the elephant for the state, uh, you know. Uh, Tharus and, 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 and so there were some Dimals who were employed in uh, as a grass, you know, uh, sub cutting the grass for the elephant as well, um, you know. So they were also, uh, the question is, uh, what did they gain out of that? They were always treated as Mahot, or they were also asked elephant uh, take care, which also bring in, you know, they, they have a very you know, intimate knowledge about, you know, the ecology of elephant, their social behaviors, and I think Peter Locke, uh, um, uh, a scholar from New Zealand, has written beautiful work on, on you know, elephant as in human, uh, the relationship between elephant and, uh, and Tharus. Uh, but then they were never you know, rewarded in a way that was, you know, so they, they never benefited uh, to the extent that you know, uh, other benefited. I think that's a very important question, how you know, uh, within, even within that kind of like, you know, uh, relation, there was a hierarchy involved. And one thing that you know is what struck me when I was coming to you know to the physical sites of this you know workshop, I mean the exhibition, in front of this Dharak uh, Yukto, uh, um, in a tap, there was a pictures of this you know royal hunting, and the late king Birendra and uh, the late queen Ashwarya riding in an elephant, and that and 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 all like you know villagers you know uh, making them you know bringing the game animals uh, towards them. What struck me there is that, you know, the Tharus were standing in, uh, you know, on, on elephant, and there, the, there was this king, uh, the, the uh, Nepal's then, then king, and the king had this, you know, different dress, you know, hunting dress, like the hat, you know, and everything, you know, and the gun. And the Tharus were kind of like, were, most of the they were asked to dress in the Nepali dress, you know, like, you know, Surwal and then in a Nepali hat, just standing like you know holding you know uh, very roughly. And I was wondering what was happening to them, you know, like uh, wearing Nepali topi and and going in this jungle safari, while the kings and the, and the queen look very European, you know, uh, European with their dresses and and Tharus uh, needed to be perform the Nepaliness, quote and with their dress, you know. I think that pictures was very striking to me to know. You know, and, and then there is an elephant. So now who rides on an elephant and who guards the elephant? I think that picture also speaks a lot uh, about uh, the thing that we're, trying, uh, we're discussing right now. Therefore, I think um, what Professor Trotman has, you know, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a wonderful book for sure. I think we also need to, you know, sometimes what happens when historians try to write a very generalized, you know, big history, I think uh, this kind of like, you know, localized uh, history also, uh, uh, there is a uh, we, there is a need to uh, uh, I'm not the first one to say that there is a, uh, there is a need to read against this kind of history. I think um, as much as you know what they have said from the state perspective, yes, the elephants were important resources. You know, one of the reasons that you know uh, the uh, the the king uh, the palace wanted to control the Tarai was to export the elephant. That was very precious, uh, you know, for various reasons uh, for earning. But again. It was also a way of, uh, I would argue, of, in, of continuing the dominations of the, uh, the central power over the Adivasi.
No, I mean, those photos actually were placed there quite intentionally, I think. And then we didn't also didn't include uh, captions for it very intentionally. <laughs> But I think, yeah, I mean, those photos uh, are from 87, and I think those are scenes of, uh, you know, the, it, this is happening after the National, Chitu National Park was already founded. And I think the intention was not necessarily point out how uh, dissolute or immoral the, king, the kings of Nepal were, which perhaps they were, but, uh, but more to sort of, I think, to, again, you know, to maybe think about the forms of these kind of political kind of, you know, the notions of powers that are being activated. The king and the, the, the royal family, what are they sort of, what kind of forms of authority they are activating or trying to activate in that scene? I think that's what uh, at least I was thinking about. Uh, and I wanted to ask you that. The other uh, policy uh, that is relevant here, uh, you brought it up already, but uh, sort of the specter of colonialism. Um, and I think uh, the, the, that, the term colonialism I think for a lot of Nepalese and Nepali thinkers, uh, it sits quite awkwardly. I think uh, because of this idea or the sense that Nepal was a place that was not, that was never colonized. Uh, that's sort of the na narrative that's been peddled to us. Um, and it's only in actually uh, in indigenous spaces where there is a more active sort of use of that term. Um, and what you've already described, uh, sort of the experience of the hill people's domination in the Tarai area, um, uh, being spoken spoken through that uh, through the term of colonialism. But I think uh, beyond that, in addition to that, I think this question of the big uh, the big C colonialism, which is sort of the global experience that you know of the last two hundred years, uh, or three hundred years, or five hundred years actually. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about uh, the implication of of that broader history of colonialism for this place. And I, I can, in Skin of Chitwan, I see a certain threads. I think uh, the presence of the, uh, the, the British, British or more, uh, more accurately, the East India Company, actually, if you look at the earlier time. And so their implication for how Tarai was being made. Um, and also, I think, uh, later on, which we both remarked on, uh, especially for the, the period that the Skin of Chitwan is looking at, uh, which is sort of at the end of the the British colonialism, and then you see uh, this new interest in the Cold War period, uh, the American sort of um, uh, world-making agendas, uh, really sort of making a deep impact uh, in Chitwan, uh, specifically. Uh, that has like uh, several consequences, um, including one of um, how the place is made so that new set of uh, actually hill people can come in. Uh, what you talked about, the disease eradication, malaria uh, eradication, of course, being one of the main stories of that time and, and that place. Uh, and how that uh, one consequence is being um, sort of has a direct implication for uh, the possibility of indigenous life form, life world in that place. Uh, we talked about sort of what happens when uh, the you know this idea of uh, the experts you know the new the new experts who are who are coming in uh, and telling people how to farm how to live um, and actually I would like to tra tie the coming of these new regimes of health public health but also general education is very much tied to these uh, projects of building expertise uh, actually taking. Um, stripping actually local forms of knowledge, indigenous forms of knowledge away from um, the from Tharus and other indigenous people there, uh, and also I mean, would you? I want I wanted you to sort of speak about uh, your encounters in your research about uh, the implications of this broader colonial history for this place, uh, imperial, I would say. Uh, thank you. Uh, it was uh, a very important point. Uh, uh, but I, I should, I should really say this: that my, the group that you know, uh, my study really hasn't focused too much on what you are saying. One, uh, the case of Chitwan is unique in its sense. It was uh, an experimental, you know, you know, intervention uh, of the Nepal's uh, Nepal government and you know uh, the foreign power and represented by the U.S. at the time, you know. For, for implementing this idea of you know modernization, modernizing, modernizing Nepal through Bikas. Um, and uh, I think uh, right now, I think I should just say that you know Robert Robertson, Tom Robertson has written extensively on these issues, particularly uh, on Chitwan, you know how malaria was uh, uh, you know um, malaria land reform, you know anti malaria um, malaria were located uh, you know uh, in terms of the uh, emerging Cold War and the threat that you know. 
uh, if there is a no land reform, communist uh, will take over Nepal, and those are there. But coming, coming to, like going back, going to uh, the Mal's case, uh, there was, uh, it was more of a, you know, there was not any plan in intervention as in Tichon, the kind of thing we see, the massive, you know, uh, destruction of the forest. But having said that, uh, there was, there was always, uh, there had been a long attempt uh, on the part of Nepali state to reclaim uh, forest in, in Morong and, you know, and turn that into agricultural field to the extent that there was, a, a, you know, the government had said, anyone can come to Morong and grab as much land they want, provided that they paid the tax. So in, in a way, you know, the idea that, you know, uh, this particular area, uh, and you can just come down uh, from anywhere and grab as much as land you can, uh, shows in how uh, the Nepal's, uh, uh, you know, regime approached that space. What was more for them, you know? Uh, but, you know, uh, people were not able to go there. You know, they had a, they had a lot of challenges. So, um, but having said that, I should also highlight one thing, then I come to your, you know, the other point, is that it's not that, you know, Dimals and Tharu, they, it's not like they did not want heal people to come in. It's not, you know, I mean, I think, you know, even in your, uh, in the um, um, exhibition, it's there, um, people say, they like, they welcome people coming from outside, you know. But I think we should also understand the fact that, uh, when, for example, in the case of, you know, Morang, when, uh, during the malarial time, when hill peoples were traveling to, uh, uh, to Tarai and across Tarai to do, go to India uh, to do trade, so they could just go there in certain period during the winter time. By now, this time, they would run away, you know. By this time, they would just run away then. So there was a you know, very small window of time where they could actually, you know, go there and interact. But then at the time, the relationship between Hill people and the Tarai Adiboshi were more of an, you know, you know, I would call it in a very, very friendly way. Because one could be very much uh, in an instrumental way, because the Hill people, whoever, for example, let's say, you know, a Limbu family would come to, you know, uh, they had to go to Mora, uh, you know, Rangeli to sell their, uh, you know, ghee, or like, you know, maybe oranges, or maybe, you know, their woolen products. So they need to travel through this, you know, dense forest, and and the Mals would be look. The Mals would be the first group of Tarai people uh, community they would encounter. So they had a, some kind of, you know, kinship relationship. They would do the meat relationship, and they, so they all had their own people, you know. So they had a specific relationship, and it was based on reciprocity. They would come. They would say, you know, uh, they would use the, you know, uh, in a kinship term. And they would bring, you know, gifts from the hills, and you know, give them, and and they would, in Dimal would happily, you know, host them, and they would go to do their business, and come back again, and go back. So, and there was, you know, during the uh, during the winter time, they would bring their cattle into the Dimal's uh, village, and then uh, and then go back. So there was this kind of reciprocity, and this changed when Tarai became, when Tarai was opened up, with the eradication of malaria, with the intervention. I think that's. Then you know, uh, for these people, the bikas, the mo the modernity, it had its you know rewards in terms of you know ex uh, impo uh, opening up the access of education to bringing more modern, but it also a new forms of colonialism. It it marginalized to them to the extent that then when hill people started to come down, young you know for example a 14 would uh, year old uh, kid uh, from the hill groups would uh, refer to the Dhimal, you know, grandparents as Tong or Timi, yeah. you know. So that relationship changed. I think that's, that's it's a very important to understand. And, and that had a context. So the grabbing of land, you know, the, the bringing of, the, the coming of uh, uh, roads, Mohinder Raj Marga, um, highway, and most importantly, the clearing of forest you know, um, you know, Dimal would, you know, I have so many, you know, um, but heartbreaking stories of how, you know, when uh, forests were gone, for example, uh, like w the one we saw, but, you know, the forest had big roots. They could not be uprooted. 
So the Imams were asked to burn the root you know, of all these trees, and they would do that for months, and they have to wait and see this. You know. So you just imagine that you know, there was a forest, patch of forest that's gone, and there is a root, and that you have to fight it, and the fire would be there, like smoke would be there for a month. You know, that will continue. And how devastating scenario was for them, you know, the, the memories and, you know, and there are sacred places uh, turning into ashes uh, for someone that they didn't know, you know. And they were forced to do so. First they were, you know, so, and then this, and then comes this, you know, uh, and with modernization, with modernity, what comes is a very drastic relationship with the land. Let me give you some an example. For example, uh, uh, when Dimal, you know, uh, they tend to do still, when Dimal would, you know, uh, start their agriculture, when agriculture season comes, they will first organize a village ritual. It's all the villagers would come. One of the reasons for coming up uh, is, uh, you know, to ask for, you know, blessing everything. Uh, but it's also a time to recognize all the other beings in their uh, uh, world, social world, and the uh, you know, quote unquote, natural world, because it's not a distinction for them. So they would recognize the, you know, the rivers. They recognize the forest. They recognize the, all the species, including mosquitoes. Let me let me give an example. During their you know, uh, uh, village rituals, the village priest would invite, for example, rottens, invite birds. Uh, would uh, would call on the mosquitoes and they will throw a fist for them, saying that you know please have this, and when our crops are ready, please don't destroy them. We could argue that if the mal priest had that power, if uh, they they claim, they could actually eliminate you know, they could eliminate the mosquitoes. But what the mal know that mosquito needs to bite us so that they can also survive. In the same way we can we, we need to survive. So what I'm saying that you know, then I mean they had this acknowledgement. What I would call they have they have a sociality with non-human actors in their you know uh, lived world uh, in a such a way that you know the idea was not to deny the existence of the other being, but to acknowledge them in their everyday life. And when, for example, when the crops are ready. They will again, you know, thank all these beings in the other regions, and that continues. But now the the problem is, now they will perform the rituals, but their their lived world has changed, so it becomes a tradition, but the meanings are getting lost, uh, you know. So now what happens is that when an agricultural scientist come, what they do is they will ask the males to put more fertilizers, more you know, more kind of things. But an agriculture training, I would, I would argue, you know, training would never consist of saying, you know, really need to worship the land, you know, land. So land is not taken as an, uh, a lived being in the way, you know, the Imals and, you know, Thado would take. I'm not saying that this is only among the Adivasi. That's not my point. But I work with the Adivasi. That's what I'm using this example. So. Now, you know, uh, in, in, in the, you know, one of the, uh, in the voice that I've recording, I've heard uh, in the exhibition is that a Tharo woman very strongly said, if you don't put poison, there won't be any agriculture. I think when she was saying that, you know, her word, and when the way she pronounced the word big, it's so powerful, it comes so powerful. And, and I think it's, it's it's something, a reality, but it also is something that she hasn't thought before that, you know, you need to put poison in order to produce something and survive and eat it, you know. So the poison is for the soil, and of course, it is impacting them, you know. And she's also cautioning the poison with the state. But the the government doesn't do anything. I think that even a, a one, this, uh, you know, one beats of, you know, uh, interview actor speaks about, you know, uh, how new forms of knowledge um, have become so dominant, and we have all been part of that knowledge system, 
And I, I think that's where uh, our, the discussion that to follow, that's where the questions of the idea of indigeneity is relevant. That's, I think, where, where I, would, I would like to locate indigeneity, you know, because the Himals are still doing that rituals, and they're still trying to understand, you know, uh, teaching their kids that land is not just a milling, something that you can sell in the market and, and build a house. Land is also a deity. Land is also something you have to recognize, you have to pray, you know. So when your parents die, you must offer them a soil rec to recognize the fact that your lives are part of the soils, you know. I think that kind of, you know, uh, teachings, that kind of, you know, culture, Orientations exist in all parts of Nepal, among all groups. I'm not saying this is just for indigenous, you know. But I think that's where uh, perhaps we need to, uh, you know, pay more attention and like how there are still these kind of localized, very important, valid practices of lives, uh, which might which might uh, give us some ideas about what kind of future we want to imagine. No, thank you, Janet. Talking a lot, maybe like. Oh no, no. I mean, la we're getting there. We're ending soon. <laughs> no, there is time. A little bit more, but I'm really glad we've reached this point in our conversation because uh, at the end, I did want to. Uh, uh, I really liked how you talked about sort of uh, you know the human or certain human sense of their own vulnerabilities. Uh, and the recognition of the vulnerabilities of other non-humans. And I think that's partly what we've been sort of discussing uh, throughout this festival and the programs. But, uh, and also relating to what Alana said earlier, that the fact that we perform a certain kind of negotiation with mosquitoes, or the Himals do, um, or that, you know, there's a certain kind of diplomatic relations that you imagine that you have with animals and pl of soils and um, uh, mosquitoes. It kind of tells about the, the assumption of the equality of, uh, of the different sort of critters are in, in the conception that the Dhimals have for, for themselves. Um, I really wanted to, I think, uh, I, what you said just now, I was saving it for the last question, so this may, doesn't need to be long. But uh, I know you've been sort of, you know, we've been talking about these ideas of reciprocity, um, actually gift giving and all of that, which are all fundamental, you know, anthropological questions, uh, which I know you've been working with as well. We've been talking about uh, kinship. And I really like, uh, I was very curious to know, find out that uh, you've been sort of really re-examining uh, and you've already talked about it just now too, uh, but the older relation between the hill people and the indigenous people of the Tarai, uh, you are very keen to revisit the older uh, sort of kinship ties mm -hmm. or affinal ties perhaps mm -hmm. even. Uh, I know you've been writing about sort of um, different kind of indigenous groups also considering themselves as brothers, uh, as sort of kin relations. Um, I wanted to ask you like just to close uh, the conversation today, uh, what, why should we be like, I want you to guide us, you know, like uh, how to do the skin thinking uh, mm -hmm. in the kind of context of um, the political and sort of cultural context and moment we are at. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Divas. Uh, uh, I think it also has to do with what you, you know, the question that you posed me earlier, uh, you know, the idea of indigeneity as, you know, as being a bounded, you know, uh, identity, you know, a people with, you know, one culture, one language, one territory and which is there. But at the same time, I think uh, relation are of, uh, you know, identities are relational always, you know, it, it's a relational. So, so when I was studying, uh, you know, the Mal, and one of the things they would always, for example, they would ask me, and you know, it, it is very, you know, um, very common in Nepal is, when I say Jana, they also want to know, you know, my family name. Uh, I'm right. Oh, I mean the Dazubai Resuni. So even a woman would call me, use the word Dazubai. So like Dimal Rai, Dimal Limbu, I mean the Dazubai. So the idea that, you know, Dimal in Tarai and in a group from Tarai and Rai and other groups from Hills, they are related. They are actually, you know, uh, from the same group, they claim. So they have different myths. And, and we can we can we can analyze that you know idea belief from different perspective you know uh, and when that kind of uh, you know belief system emerges uh, and but again there is a long history of uh, which I came to later on there is a long history of sociality between the Mals and the hill groups 
you know, hill groups, uh, which perhaps you know, predates the you know, formation of Nepal, Nepali state. I think that history is equally important for us to know, you know uh, what we call like the making of a place. So Tarai was never an isolated uh, space. It was never an isolated entity. It was always, uh, you know, it was had been a very strategic area, um, lo located, uh, you know, the glo emerging global, you know, forces. For example, Morong was sometimes claimed by the, you know, uh, East India, sometimes claimed by by the, you know, uh, state in Sikkim, sometimes claimed by, you know, uh, you know, uh, Bhutan. So, you know, so there was always this emerging political thing. But at the same, at the level of people. You know, uh, uh, despite this, whatever what what's happening, there were also a long history of you know uh, exchange and sharing, you know, common to them. You know, maybe for the survival. You know, maybe for you know exchanging uh, economies and you know uh, thing. And so that relationship uh, is, uh, uh, I think, it's also important for us to like discuss, and not see you know that you know people always. Sometimes you know there was conflict between the Mals and Limbus and Rice, for example. But most of the time, you know, they, they had there had been a long relationship between that. Uh, but what happens with that? With the interactions, with the coming of a modernization, with the roads and with the you know uh, what infrastructure come, and that relationship suddenly changed into something. It it becomes more like one group uh, taking advantage of the others. So I think that also like, you know, questions us, you know, how, you know, uh, how this relationship, ethnic, uh, in this intergroup relationship uh, actually altered in its essence and its politics from the kind of things, uh, you know, fine relationship. I think that's where I'm trying to, you know, go uh, forward. But uh, having said that, now the question is, again, what uh, your, your group is trying to do is what kind of archives we have now? Because you don't get a relation, archives for relationship. These are not recorded, you know. I think that's a very, you know, when we, uh, that's a different part. Of like, what are the archives for, you know, indigenous histories? You know, they don't, uh, you know, there are not many, you know, paper archives. So I think that's a very challenge. It's a challenge. I don't have an answer for that. I'm also like splitting. For me, the people themselves, they are also repository of the archive, their memories. And one thing that I've been looking at is the rituals, uh, you know, ritual practices, uh, and the landmarks. And for example, when Dimals go to some place, uh, the land animates some stories. They would they would tell us this is where, uh, you know, uh, Madumala. Oh, Madumala is a place. They would say, oh, Madumala used to be uh, an area where uh, people from the hills uh, used to come there uh, to sell things, uh, to, to barter. So now, you know, the, therefore, this place and the place names are so important, uh, and which are which have been forcefully changed. Uh, uh, just to give an example, uh, there is a small uh, Dimal, you know, Dimal village, just by the you know uh, Himalayan tea garden, which is owned by Ganendra now. Which is very surprising. I mean, I don't want to go there. How he came to, you know, I mean, obviously. The, uh, so, what happened was, you know, the place was named after earlier. The place was named after a fish uh, that was found in the river, river stream. The mal would fish that, you know, and they would. That was the name of the village. And later on, when the, you know, tea state came there, uh, some worker family from the hill opened a tea shop there. Dimal Din used to drink tea. So it, there was a tea shop, so you know, all the workers would come to other tea. And now the place name became Chiapasal. <laughs> now the, the tool became you know, Chiapasal, tea shop. So, and then uh, you know, because of the uh, um, tea garden, uh, uh, tea state, because of the you know, planting of the tea, it, it, it's a monocrop, it dried up the river, the fish gone. So now, even when Dimal said, you know, this is the name of the place, the young Dimal would not remember it because there is no river, there is no the fish. So this is an example of how, you know, uh, the loss of a place names uh, is not just a name, but there is a, you know, entire, you know, different history uh, would be. And if you look at, if you question why this place is called Chiapasal, it also opens up different forms of colonisms in new disguised, uh, in the name of industrialization, in the name of uh, you know, building, uh, constructing a 
city state won by then royal family, uh, you know, and there is a long history how, you know, he came to that, and there is, you know, Santa Lama, you know, I, I don't want to go there, it's a lot, you know, um, uh, we are very, you know, anthropologists are very, you know, defame, you know, for, you know, tying up so many stories, so I will stop there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you know, we'll finally open the floor. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you so much for the conversation. It was lovely to hear as well. Um, I am just going to ask a very small question, and I apologize if I'm misinformed because I'm not very knowledgeable about indigeneity, but in all this conversation about uh, the polity, the politics, state apparatus, and all of that, I was also wondering how or if uh, indigeneity is con uh, conceived of or discussed in terms of class and how that plays into uh, what we see today in conservation efforts or in terms of their people's relationships to lands, land as well. Thank you. I think this is for me. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you. May I know your name? Oh, I'm, I'm Paus. Paus. Uh, um, thank you, Paus. I mean, this is a very important uh, question. I mean, class, um, the issue of, you know, let me, uh, you know, rephrase this this way. Uh, you. Uh, to bring the discussion. Indigeneity, the concept of indigeneity, uh, you know, one of the major criticism against it by, mostly by, you know, uh, scholars who do not, uh, you know, find indigeneity to be useful is bringing the question of class, uh, which is very important, uh, which is very important. And, but again, uh, the way, there is a two parts of indigeneity that uh, I need to, you know, I, I, I didn't really make it clear when I was speaking earlier. So indigeneity as a form of political activism, right-based discourses, you know, you know, that's there. And the other one is like more scholarly you know, analysis of like, uh, on, on like, you know, the knowledge and everything about indigeneity. So I'm not saying these are two different, but it's, it, it, these are the two parts uh, in, in cons uh, uh, towards the production of knowledge on, in, on indigeneity. When it comes to activism, uh, you know, active, and we all know that you know, uh, activism follows certain kind of discourses. And some discourses uh, are geared towards certain kind of objectives, you know, um, uh, claim, uh, claim making. In that sense, you know, people would use indigeneity as a very homogeneous entity where they would not emphasize on the class differences. Uh, but uh, scholars have also discussed, also shown, for example, even my work, we have also like shown how class, gender, and other inequalities become contested uh, issues within indigenous groups, uh, among the activists, for example. You know, uh, among the activists, for example. Uh, but when they are approaching uh, of let's say a forum or when they go to the UN or other places, they have to speak, they have to use certain language and reporters which are needed. But what happens sometimes is that you know, based on that kind of like narratives, people would you know, blind or would claim that you know, indigeneity does not uh, you know, uh, bring the class issues. I think uh, it, uh, indigeneity does have a way of talking about class relation which might be different than a conventional approach to class, but I'll, I'll just like any that class, uh, gender, and other forms of inequalities are very important uh, issues within indigeneity. Uh, uh, I'm sure like you, 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 um, uh, you are also aware of some of the you know, shortcomings uh, in other you know, um, activism, other movements also. Thank you. Can What's I add something time? to that? Um, I think uh, it's a very important question. But I think when we talk about class, it's also important to think about class in a lived way, you know, and I think that's where you begin to see the distinction. I think uh, if you look at indigenous, especially Tharu, which I've looked at a little bit, there's definitely, it's definitely a hierarchical kind of an uh, uh, arrangement, right? Uh, but if you look at sort of, uh, and Janakda has already talked about some of it, let's say like marriage relations, you know, who, who can marry who? 
uh, who's giving bride or groom to who? Um, where are those exchanges happening? And, and sort of the literal sort of uh, physical distinctions between, let's say, a chaudhari um, and a, let's say, regular peasant in the, in the village. How, how much are those distinctions? Um, that, if you look at that, you'll find that uh, those distinctions have actually exacerbated in the, in the modern context. I think uh, the class question becomes even more urgent uh, only in the last 50, 60 years, which has its own sort of history in some ways. Arjun Gunaratni has also talked about it a little bit, how the, uh, the elites of the Tharus begin to sort of uh, turn for marriage relations about who they identify to with, uh, rather than to other people in the villages, uh, to others outside actually. And so the formation of the Tharu identity actually has to do with, in a way, the consolidation of class as well. Uh, but I think it's, it's important, you, you see what I mean, right? I think uh, it's important to pay attention to those things too. Thank you, hi. Um, in my head it's connected, <laughs> I hope. Out loud it is as well. So, Agina, you said something along the lines of, and then there aren't any agriculture trainings that teach Bhumi Puja, for example, right? I mean, I've been just thinking about this a lot of like indigeneity as of place, you know? So now we have regenerative agriculture, permaculture, or Junte, um, the forests that we have cleared for agriculture now, they're being reforested, but maybe monocrops of, you know, forests for logging or community forests. Um, in this sort of change, and also in my head, the other things that's going is like, so many people are moving for work because there's no way to survive locally. You know? So with this migration, with this like new political economy of like constant flux and change, what is this changing definition of indigeneity and relationship to place now in agriculture, in um, conservation, in how you relate to place? Like how is that playing out, do you think? Uh नाम की बनो कृपया जी धन्यवाद एकदमै महत्त्वपूर्ण प्रश्नको लागि अब म ठक्कै तपाईले भनेको आई थिंक इट्स अ भेरी इम्पोर्टेन्ट क्वेशन्स लाइक यु नो पीपल्स मूविंग आउट बट अगेन यु नो इट्स अ रियलिटी दैट पीपल्स आर मूविंग आउट बट इफ आई इफ मे आई ब्रिंग द दिमाल्स केस दे आर मूविंग आउट they're not moving out. The idea that you know uh, all people are leaving the villages, going you know I you know Dimal's uh, now around twenty thousand plus people, and there are also people who are uh, many of like in each household may have one family members working abroad, but they're coming back. They're coming back. Maybe they're just like you know moving a little bit out of the village, but they are very much in Morong and Sunchari. So the idea that all people are moving needs to be like in you know, a question again. Uh, so the question is why they are not moving out, <laughs> you know, why they are not moving out, because there are certain cultural, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, culture uh, connections to place, you know, to be a dimal, you must belong to a shrine, you must be a member of a shrine in order to be a member. So there are like 500 plus dimals in Kathmandu. For long they were feeling, for long they were feeling placelessness. Because they could not have a shrine in Kathmandu. You can just imagine like how, who would give a place to have a shrine for 500 people. And they, you know, so, the, so they were able to negotiate with some of the, uh, you know, uh, municipalities. Now they have one place, uh, you know, uh, near, up, up, you know, uh, sorry, getting old. Uh, um, uh, you know, uh, Bodo and Mati Jungle, Ma, when you look at a Sano shrine, Manasa. Now they are, so, so now they feel like you know the Kathmandu is one village, but again, a very important thing uh, to consider here is that Kathmandu for Dimal, uh, Dimal from the organization perspective, is Zilla Saka. It's very important. Not many ethnic organize. Uh, for example, take a case of Limbu Rice. They're all headquarters. Their ethnic headquarters are based in Kathmandu. So Kathmandu is always the kendra. But for Dimal, Kathmandu is a Zilla Saka. Headquarter is still Morong. So with the class, again, one of the things that I've tried to show in my research, you know, based on Dimal's finding is that, so Dimal's are doing activism where it is most needed, in Dimal's you know, land, in Dimal's territory. They're not actively doing activism here in Kathmandu, 
like many others, uh, you know, uh, indigenous groups are doing. So they have focused their activisms in, uh, you know, in their own areas, territory. So, so the question that you know, uh, what you say is, so now, of course, uh, indigeneity. Uh, so there is a, you know, indigeneity, like all identity, all concepts, go through changes. But certain, certain, you know, what brings all these things together is again in the, people's relationship with the land. Not, as I said, when, when, when I, as I said, if you just focus land as a field of agriculture farming, I think we're also missing the point. So land as a territory, land as, land, there are relations with the rivers. So each Dimal houses still are like, you know, tied to their village shrine. Each year, they also, uh, you know, many times a year, they still, you know, recognize the rivers. Even the rivers are drying up. You know, they still recognize the rivers. They, even the forest are gone. There are some trees that are still recognizing the forest. So they're still continuing to rebuild, you know, remake the place, even the skin of the place, so as to bring, you know, uh, uh, so, so as the skin of the place looks very unidentified from what used to. But they must know that it's still their place, and they're trying their best. And uh, with the, you know, the, so there's things are changing in a way. Sometimes they are, uh, in some cases, they are more successful in reclaiming the plane, uh, uh, case. But sometimes they're also like, you know, being just out of the power. Just to give an example, um, there is a municipality called Kane Pokhori. You know, Kane means Kane means ear, you know. So there is a, there is a small pond uh, which is named after, you know, Kane, ear. So there is, a, this pond is a historical, you know, it has a sacred meanings to the mouths. But the, uh, but the municipality built a big statue of ear <laughs> in front of the lake, you know, saying, you know, this is the Kanye Pukuri. They wanted to turn that into a touristic, uh, you know, picnic spot, you know. So that's the kind of infrastructure mode Nepal is going through, uh, and which has increased uh, with, you know, locals, uh, uh, government uh, having more power. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying federalism is, uh, you know, doing this, but, in many other cases, uh, you know, indigenous people have been very successful. You can you can uh, take an examples of many um, BDC, uh, many uh, uh, excuse me, many municipalities in uh, Solukambu where they have renamed uh, the village in their language. They have made the their, so you know. Uh, so there is also you know federalism has also opened up the new possibilities of engaging. Uh, what it means to be an uh, indigenous in you. Th therefore, I think uh, we need to understand, uh, I think we need, uh, I think uh, I would suggest that we take indigenous as an emerging, cons uh, you know, phenomena, uh, and people are negotiating, you know, uh, like, you know, people not doing the farming, okay, uh, even their great, great ancestor were not doing the farming, as I try to highlight, you know, and then still, but I think their connection to the place, you know, the histories that they want to, you know, they want to remember through the place, to the territory, what I call placemaking, is still an active and important, you know, important uh, uh, project they're doing. But there are a lot of challenges on that. Uh, I think that's uh, where uh, I think our maybe like we can think more about what are the challenges of placemaking in this time, you know, in, in these junctures of history. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Mega. And my question is along the lines of uh, former colonialists or people with a generational history of wealth who are now in true philanthropy. Or maybe they might have an exploitative history. Uh, maybe you know, they, in the past, like they might have tried to squash an indigenous land or something. May, it may sound a bit hypothetical, but it does happen, it has happened. But now maybe they may be trying to invest in like community projects or, or some sort of philanthropy. So my question is where do we uh, make the boundary or where do we feel that, where do we say that, okay, this is not good or maybe, okay, maybe, maybe they are trying to change or where do we uh, divide the line is my question. Megazio, bro. <laughs> I think it's a very, thank you for the question. Uh, you know, it's also, uh, your question also, uh, you know, really pushed me to think 
uh, uh, change some of my hard disks, whatever, if I have any here, uh, to look for those. But, but now, to my, uh, you know, based on, based on my research, uh, there are people who know very vividly with concrete evidences how their land territory were taken away. You know, uh, I, I, for example, the Himalayan tea state won by Ganendra. And I don't want to be in a politically, uh, I don't want to be in trouble by, you know, uh, you know uh, displacing some name, but there are like a you know, big airline company, you know, uh, their ancestor, you know, uh, uh, you know, so there are so many birtas and everything that came. So they, they really, you know, used uh, the indigenous, um, you know, they, they, they used the land. And, and of course, now, you know, uh, in the past, people knew that, people know that. But again, I don't, again, I don't want to portray the, you know, the idea, the, the image that indigenous people are like, you know, Dimals are anti-development. You know, that's also not the, not the case. The Imams are also striving for schools. The Imams are striving for you know, some other kind of infrastructure. But in a way that would also empower them. You know, that hasn't been there. So, so, so they know that what had happened to them and who had done them, uh, the wrongdoings. They have the evidences. They have the stories. But I think the question is, where can they go? Do the Nepal's current legal system allows them to contest these kind of cases? We, we all know the answers. And they don't have a other kind of, uh, or to what extent Nepali you know, group can go to international court and, and bring Nepali state for a negotiation, for a court hearing. And you know, we, have, we have a long, you know, we have a recent history you know, of you know, transition justice in just being dismissed uh, by the, you know. So they know the regimes are very powerful and, and hopefully some, you know, if the question is, if the indigenous movements can become stronger and if there is a way in which indigenous pe people can be politically empowered in a positive way, I think these issues can be, you know, can become a, a point of departure, a point of discussions. Uh, but I think it will take some time. Uh, well, hopefully, I, 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 I I hope that I'm optimistic someday, uh, you know, there will be a discussion. Uh, these things will open up. Uh, for that, you know, we need to discuss this issue more and more. Uh, but there is a tendency, I should say, among scholars, among political, uh, political parties, uh, among, uh, you know, the regimes in Nepal, to silence these kind of issues to consider these kind of issues and as non-issues, being, you know, or being anti-national, you know. And so there is a, so even now, medias are really not interested to write about, uh, you know, the skin of Chitwan, you know. So there is a, you know, huge tendency in the politics to silence the skin of Chitwan and the, its, its masses. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very much, uh, I, can, I can say it's a very much collaborative project on behalf of those in power to silence this kind of voices. And this is not just about Dimals. There is a stories about, there is a experiences of what happened to Dimal women when, you know, uh, uh, what happened to the Dimal women, what happened to the Tharu women, and other like, you know, issues like what happened to Dimal children when they attended the schools and when, when, when the ridicule of their language, how that impacted their, you know, education. So these are, these are very, important uh, salient issues, but with the idea that we are now in an in a era of Sambridi, progress, which has been a buzzword, and then, you know, uh, that uh, roads and infrastructures are the answers to our, our will to development, uh, are I think are also like playing against, uh, you know, even like discussing this kind of issue. So I'm really thankful to, you know, Divas and the, you know, and the team for inviting me. Uh, and sharing my my thoughts, uh, you know. Hopefully, you know, uh, we can continue these discussions, uh, or, or you know, maybe you know, uh, we can continue the discussion one way or other. Thank you very much. Yeah. No, thank you so much, Anak. I, I've I've always learned so much from you, and I, this became another opportunity for me. Keep coming to our events. I don't think we have vo we don't hear voices like you enough around us. Uh, so. 
this is an open invitation for you to engage with us, uh, to our sort of uh, crowds and audiences mm -hmm. also. Yeah. Thank you for everyone for, for your participation, you know, your, your, you know, uh, uh, you know, your encouragement, I would say. Thank you very much. Thank you.